it's helping families or, or seniors who want to stay in their home, right. but are really feeling the affordability crunch. Uh, if their house is too big or they can make room in their basement, in their garage, a part of the house, if they can make a legal suite out of that, the government is incentivizing that. So it's helping those families stay in their homes. Those seniors stay in their homes longer. And it's also adding inventory and it's adding inventory typically at the more affordable end of it. Welcome back to the Bamford & Co. podcast. My name is Greg Bamford. I'm here today with a friend of mine, Chris Garrett. Uh, she's the CEO of SRA. Hey, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Greg. <laughs> thanks for the invite. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. We've got, uh, I'm looking for some insight on quite a few things, real estate today. But let's start off with a little bit of your background and what you do for the association. Yeah, well, uh, I'm CEO of Saskatchewan Realtors Association. Been there for about three years, but I've been in housing for over a decade. Um, so land development, home construction, real estate side, both, you know, uh, commercial, residential. And I also sit on some boards that also gravitate around housing. So it's just a passion of mine. And so I'm really happy to be at the SRA as well. It's awesome. And we, we love you being there. Um, oh, thank I, you. It's, uh, it was awesome when Chris came to our organization. I just saw us kind of moving forward in the way that I saw the, the association should be moving forward. And you oh, were good. really here to support us as agents and also the lookout for the community in a whole, right? So, and I think that's our job uh, all together, right? So. That's what realtors do, actually. Right. They're in their neighborhoods. They're the boots on the ground. They actually know what's going on in the economy before it actually hits the stats. Right, because you guys are dealing at the kitchen tables and the in the boardrooms. You guys are talking about future plans, and you guys have that pulse. Uh, and I I argue with our decision makers, anyways, that there's no other sector out there that has that pulse uh, consistently throughout the province. I mean, we have almost 1,800 members throughout the province right. who are dealing in real estate and have that pulse everywhere. Yeah. And we're just fortunate at the office to you know collect that data and and represent the sector as best we can yeah we do have a lot of conversations and we do <laughs> we do touch almost every single household in the city in some way yeah if you're it, right right like it like from the very beginning to the very end and through people's yep. lives it's uh it's awesome when people refer us to their parents because they've had a great experience oh and i so love those course, stories right? so yep. or when you find i just had this conversation someone was sharing a secret but like we sometimes find out when people when 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 People are pregnant before their family does. Because <laughs> See, you know ahead of time. We, we know way ahead of time. <laughs> way ahead of time. Because they're like, okay, now we're serious because we need a house, right? So um, it's interesting on that side. But I think a couple things that we've been, uh, we see in the media all the time yep. is a, an affordable housing, um, where we sit with inventories. Yeah. Where do you see that going? Because from my perspective and what I problem solve myself yeah. is affordable housing isn't achievable. That's what my thought is because we have an inventory problem. Yes. And so when you say we have higher interest rates, we have shortage of materials, when we have no yep. tradespeople, and to then build out capacity faster, that just means that the prices are going to increase, at least from my perspective. But yep. I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but it seems pretty simple to say like we have a problem. Well, you've been in the business how many years now? 19. Okay, so you, you've got a pulse on what's going on. Right. Um, and it's probably coming natural to you. And so uh, I has, still have to depend on stats and oh, come <laughs> expert on. advice. You led the <laughs> what, uh, Saskatchewan New Home Builders Association previously? Yes. Right? So, I mean, you probably From permits got... to, yes, to sold data, all of that. Yeah, so you've, you've been in this, like, I appreciate the compliment, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah. But you, you know, you've been around for 19 years. So what you're saying is is not untrue. Right. Um, what does it look like? I unfortunately don't think that we're going to see the relief that we hope we're going to see in the very near future. Right. Because everything that you've mentioned is absolutely true. Um, we still have a affordability inventory crisis because we have an inventory crisis, but it's really particularly on the affordability end of the continuum. Um, and really it doesn't matter where you add inventory because eventually it's also going to trickle down that continuum right so if somebody's buying you know a five hundred thousand dollar home but they're they're moving out of a three hundred 
thousand dollar home right. you can see that trickle effect and so that happens so it doesn't matter where you're adding inventory you're going to create relief the question is how quickly can you create that relief because obviously if you add inventory anywhere it's going to take a little bit of time to trickle down to the bottom as opposed to if you just have some incentives to really um, push the inventory in the segments that you really need and we're seeing that with the municipal governments right now right so another thing that i just thought of is that incentives Yes. So right now, the government is incentivizing builders yeah. to build rental properties. Yes. Well, S this is... So, okay. You keep, I was going to cut you off. You keep going. No, I'd like you to... You, I like think you to this is this. one of those policies that's really neat because it has two impacts. It's helping families or, or seniors who want to stay in their home right. but are really feeling the affordability crunch uh, if their house is too big or they can make room in their basement in their garage a part of the house if they can make a legal suite out of that the government is incentivizing that so it's helping those families stay in their homes those seniors stay in their homes longer and it's also adding inventory and it's adding inventory typically at the more affordable end of it so it has a really like a, there's two sides to that coin so it's really quite exciting we've just recently asked for the stats for both the city of regina and the city of saskatoon um, we could ask for anywhere in the province but those are really our two large centers right. that where the majority of housing permits happen and, and people are migrating here and they are right so and there is a ver there is an increase in permits being pulled uh for secondary suites and you can see when the policy came in and then there's a spike so really interesting to see the data people are taking taking it up and I'm it doesn't mean that it's for everybody you know I definitely have heard of individuals saying it, it's too much for me yes not every policy is going to be for everyone right. but it's definitely having an impact do you see that though affecting on those other incentives that's a great incentive yeah. that I think is is a positive change and so forth four plexes yeah. and those but are you also seeing the incentives that they have for rental properties where builders are now deciding to to build rental properties rather than single family homes, which we already have an inventory problem within the well, <clears throat> the new home board. In Saskatchewan, uh, we are building a lot of rental right now, despite the fact that we uh, have very low, record low vacancy. Right. Um, but you know, the average family or young professional is still looking for that single family home, right? That's that missing middle part that people are still looking for. And you would think that because we are the most affordable province in the country right now when it comes to working, living, owning a home, you would think that that would be more attainable and there would be more home ownership. The stats don't show that. The stats don't show that we have more homeowners here. And my, I would have thought that because we're the most affordable, we we would see more of that. Right. Um, but as you know, there's not a lot of product out there that's you know in a certain price range for that single family home. It's um, so when I got into real estate, the average selling price was 118,000. You could buy a 1,200 square foot bungalow on the east side in this yep. neighborhood with a, a massive uh, lot. Now I have to say, even I'm discouraged when I take my yep. clients out and even trying to find them a property under 400,000 on the east side. It's just, it's, it's disappointing how high our prices are and what they get for it now, especially when you have many families having to group together to yep. take out a mortgage to be able to do it. So, um, it, or, you I, know, parents, you know, giving some of their savings to the next generation. Which, for sure. Uh, that concerns me because yeah. we're actually impoverishing one generation to make sure that the next generation can make it. That's not a really great place to be as a society. Right. It's, uh, we're giving the information here. We're not Sorry. trying to be <laughs> like, <laughs> we're, we're both positive about trying to make positive yes. impact within our, in our neighborhoods positive. and so forth. But I mean, at the same time, this is reality. Yep. And I think a lot of times the media has, like, I, I guess, a negative approach on things. And but or the, the spin is affordable housing. And I think yeah. we have to both be real on that to, yes. of what we're actually dealing with. Um, one of the things that I see a hold up is people getting approved for permits. And that oh, could yes. be residential, that could be commercial, that could be just improvements. Uh, we just helped out um, a nonprofit uh, buy a property for a care home. Yep. Um, they're still waiting and they're and. And the hard thing is, is that they can't make, they've got 
five or six kids waiting to get in this care home, yeah. but they can't get approval. And I, and I mean, there's a long list. And then anything from builders to contractors yep. to everybody I talk about, they say it's hard because permits are way backed up. Yep. And in no way we're trying to throw, um, I guess, the city under, under the bus. Yep. But at the same time, if we're trying to create affordable housing and we're trying to bring these mm -hmm. to market as fast as we possibly can, yes. what do we need to do with the permits to make that happen is it is it a dated process or like you probably know yeah. more about this than me that is a really uh, good question and permits are a whole world onto itself um, and not all cities are made the same when it comes to permitting processing because you know you'll hear of the horror stories and out west uh, in bc with you know six to twelve to two years uh, to you know process a permit in fact it's such a problem in such provinces and some municipalities some groups have actually done the research to demonstrate for every day that a permit is not approved how much does it cost that project and that is a direct impact on affordability yeah. right so we have less that challenge here in Saskatchewan still here still but I think it's important to understand how permits work so permits have a residential component they have a commercial component and I'm gonna try to simplify it a little bit but people assume that because there's the commercial side that's where commercial permits go except large volume builds of uh, units I think it's four or six units or more actually fit under the commercial permit because they're large buildings they're not just a single-family home they require uh, more verification and due diligence from the city right, right. So that's, we have to remember that at the core of all this, the city is doing all of this to, to like, it's a risk mitigation process. Right. I mean, so, we want good building. Exactly. We want, like, we like, want that. So it's yeah. not to say we don't want that. Yeah. So, so about half of permits being pulled are multi-units, which mean they fall under the commercial. Right. So right now, the city of Saskatoon, and this is to be celebrated, I mean, I assume it's not far off. Two years ago, this was the case. They were the fastest in the country to turn around residential permits really fastest in the country you know where we fail though it's a communication process we fail because you may think five days is quick i may think five days is slow right but it's important to one determine your goal post right and two communicate your competition yeah. i'm i'm a fan of saying how is everybody else doing because this is how good we're doing right so on the residential side the city of saskatoon was was actually the best in the country and so being just the best in the country because we're one of the highest for for I mean, oh my gosh I good point prices in the world however that... there's a huge asterisk to that even though we're the best in the country our largest competitor in the g7 network is the united states the fastest in the world to process permits is in the united states so it doesn't matter if we're the fastest in the country we're still competing across the border in the u.s they know how to spit out permits very very quickly and so what system do they use that's more beneficial? You know what? I don't know. I can't answer that one. Okay. That's um, not actually your job. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to spend that there. I'm going to, I need to focus on Saskatchewan fully. Okay. But so, but then it leaves us to the commercial side and, you know, housing leaders back then, three to five years ago, had, you know, challenged the city of Saskatoon to say, if you can be the fastest in the country for residential permits, we challenge you to have that goalpost and to communicate that goalpost. Um, and so it, it's interesting to me because I need to know where are you trying to go as a government, right? You're trying to be better. What is that? Because if I understand that you're trying to be better and it's three weeks and we're at four weeks, well, uh, I, you're putting patience in my bucket. I'm like, oh, I can, I can work with that. It's, it's a week more than what everybody else is going through. Right. I can plan around that. So it's a matter of communications in my mind knowing where your permit process is, is in the process. It's not just like a big void that you're throwing your application in and not hearing back. But interestingly enough, during the pandemic, um, governments can work fast if they want to. During the pandemic, the city of Saskatoon had their online permitting process being developed. And when the pandemic happened, they had to kind of force it ahead. And um, they were able to fully, I say, move a mountain and, and bring in this online permit process much faster than they thought because there was a pandemic and it was forced on any, everybody. Yeah. So it's governments do still have to work faster. Um, that I agree. But I think one, we need to understand what the goalpost is, where are they trying to be if they want to be fastest in the country, and then understand that process a little bit better. So if you say they're too slow, 
what does too, too slow look like and what does fast enough look like? For sure. We're just trying to give insight because these yep. are things that we constantly have conversations with between our networks and, hard. and everybody that, that we see, right? So it's... And the average person or your clients... Yeah. Don't do permits every day. My clients aren't just average people. No, I'm just oh, kidding. did I say <laughs> that? <laughs> I'm just but kidding. You yeah, know, I get it. Yeah. Y- just... Some people buy a house and they, they do that once in their lifetime. Yeah, right? for sure. And so that's a really big deal. Yeah. Um, another thing that we were talking about is how you focus uh, on supporting us as agents and where do you see with technology our industry going? Um, I know that we're using a lot of AI now with yep. different things that we use for even our podcast. Yeah. And, but you leading the way, I mean, you're kind of giving suggestions to 1800 people that aren't always forward leading and aren't always looking at change. Cause I know change <laughs> is very hard. Yep. And, uh, some of these people have been, I mean, I've been in real estate for 19 years. Some of these people have been in real estate for 45 years. Yep. So their, their thought on even a phone is different than how they got, um, pager messages before, right? So technology is advancing fast. Well, look at our office. We just have the evolution of the lockbox over right. decades, and it's fascinating how it's evolved. It is, right? yeah. Um, it's. I feel it's our responsibility to ensure that the tools that you guys have as professionals are the best that they can be, or that we have a plan to get there. Right. Um, again, goalpost, right? Like, right. Where, where, what's that roadmap, and what are we trying to deliver? Um, and that comes to your biggest tool. What is it? It's your MLS system, right. right? And how you use it, but also how the public uses it. Which is Realtor.ca for which a exactly. lot of people know. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we make Realtor.ca a better experience, both in how you work with your clients, and then how do you we make a, a better experience? for you on the MLS system. So that's why this year we have a roadmap of a number of different enhancements that are coming in. Um, some is intensifying the artificial intelligence that we we already put in that we were the first in the country to do, by the you way. You were, yeah. yeah. I was very and, impressed. And I know there's, you know, we hear it from some members. How do I just turn off that artificial intelligence? But you know what? I do that myself with like Grammarly, with like all of the other yeah. artificial intelligence tools that we have. Sometimes you're like, cl- enough already, Clo- can I turn it off? GPT, there's a lot yeah. of different ones out there. But I think that's the secret. When it is time to lean in to new technologies, to artificial intelligence, that there's a time for it before it becomes normalized and that you decide what time is best for that. And that's an approach that we've really wanted to lean into. So Matrix 12 coming in, right? right? It was really important for our tech, our tech team to be able to say, no, if our members don't want to lean into this right now, we don't have to filter complaints today. So, so, <laughs> so it's interesting because <laughs> even though I'm talking about change, when you start going to type in something yes. that you do every single day and I get through 90% of it, I'm like, Habits, okay, where's the search? Like, where did they all pop up, right? Like, it's so strong. It's so hard to break. And, and we're trying to do it quickly because it's a new listing that came out and you're trying to... Chop, chop. Yeah, like you're like, okay... Revert. I'm going back the old way. I think that's the secret of us respecting your time as a professional, right? You did give us the option. So you can switch So you switch and whenever you're ready or if you have feedback, we'll be on the back end doing the changes and the modifications that we need. Uh, And when you have time and you want to, then you can turn it on and do it, right? Right. Um, And those will always be there. So I think that's an important shift in us as a professional association supporting our sector that is so reliant on technology and it's a really fine balance of we have to push forward because if we're not if we're not keep if we're not moving forward we're we're falling behind there is no staying put right we always have to be moving forward yeah. right so how do we do that while respecting our professionals um, and and creating this ecosystem and a continual growth culture right that growing and educating continually is is great and everybody will benefit yeah, you've got uh, a lot of different personalities to have to work with, with all of us realtors. But that's community, though. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I'm just saying that uh, we're all entrepreneurs. We own our own businesses. Yes, you are. Yep. And which is interesting because even though we might work under a brokerage, we have our own, like, basically business. We have our own social media, our own platform. You guys so, are all competing. Yeah, and we all compete against each other, and you're there to support us. And so it depends on what we want to take in and not. So... But I want to thank you for coming and joining us on the Banff to Go podcast. Uh, I think it was really insightful yeah. for a lot of people, and I appreciate you sharing what you did. And uh, hopefully you'll come back another time, and we can probably hit up some other uh, things that people are constantly talking about. So I'd be happy to, and hopefully you'll invite me again. For sure. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.